Okay. So members advise you now that we are being recorded and this meeting has been broadcast uh, throughout Parliament buildings and online. Um, we have currently got five members attending all via video link. We have myself, um, Sheeran, the chair, Mike Nesbitt, the vice chair. Then we've got Carol McCullen, Michelle McElveen and Paula Bradshaw. We've got apologies today from Christopher Stalford, who's on well, and I think we should, um, as we have done in the past, send him our good wishes. And we've been advised that Mark Durkin is attending uh, the meeting slightly later. So um, when, when he joins, we'll, we'll welcome him then. So it, it, rather than because we're going to lose quorum partway through the meeting and some of the members have to leave early, we'll take some of the business, some of the, the items of business that are at the, the back of the agenda pack earlier. So if you don't mind, if we can go to item number four, which is chair's business, and we don't have any chair's business this week. Then number five, we have our draft minutes. The draft minutes for our last meeting on the 17th of December last year are at page 91 of the pack. If members are content with the minutes of the 17th of December as drafted. Content. Everyone happy? Thank you. Then, so item number six, we have matters arising and we don't have any matters arising today. Unless anyone else has. Taking that as no, brilliant. And then item number seven. So you'll find we have quite a number of um, items of correspondence this week. So from page 99 of your meeting pack, you'll find that we have had requests from a number of organizations, including NIWEP, the Women's Policy Group, um, here NI and Transgender NI who have asked uh, to give evidence to the committee. So um, it's my view we should welcome them and uh, proceed with evidence sessions. Everyone's happy with that? Yeah, see thumbs up. Mm -hmm. um, we also have some um, reports. So we've got a, a Children's Law Centre. They've sent in their NGO stakeholder report to inform the list of issues for the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child. We also have the annual statement from the NA Human Rights Commission. And we've had a, a document from Dermot Nesbitt. He's provided a further work on paper on the Framework Convention for the Protection of National Minorities, which Dermot covered in his presentation to us um, late last year. So if, if members are content to note the correspondence with that one action, Agreed. Everyone's agreed. Brilliant. So we can then go back to the beginning of our car, if you don't mind, and we can turn to the second item on our agenda today, which is a briefing from Professor Dominic Bryan from Queen's University on human rights and culture. And members will have received um, a briefing and table papers from uh, Professor Bryan. I think it, it came in on Tuesday. So um, I, I want to welcome Professor Bryans to the, to the meeting. You know the big. Sarah, I think he is there, so we'll just Hold a moment and he's hopefully coming into the spotlight now. Okay. Slight delay. Ah, brilliant. Can you hear me now? We can, I can. Excellent, sorry. Not sure whether I was muting it or whatever, but I'm here. Yes. No. Listen, thank you very much for your um thank you very much for your invitation. Um and I, I think I, if if I speak for a few just for a few minutes. Um, then, then um, I'm open for any questions um, that you might like to might like to ask. Um, but again, thank you very much for your invitation. I know you've got a, a tricky job. Um, so, along with two of my colleagues, uh, Dr. Neil Jarman and um, uh, Dr. Michael Hamilton, Michael's at the University of East Anglia. Uh, we've offered you a short paper which we have called "Notes on Human Rights and Culture." and a culture of human rights. So we're, we're, we're thinking about the problem in terms of, of, of giving human rights to culture and creating a culture of human rights as two different things. Uh, the paper does not directly address the question of whether there should be a Bill of Rights for Northern Ireland. Rather, we hoped it would be helpful to make some comments about the difficulties when employing human rights in the area of culture and cultural identity and the development of a culture of, of rights. Uh, 
The paper makes clear how important we believe the development of a culture of human rights in Northern Ireland is for encouraging justice and equality, particularly in a deeply divided society like ours. Whilst it is important that legally enforceable rights exist, it is also important that people have the knowledge, the resources and the confidence to access those rights. However, reflecting the expertise and interests that Michael, Neil and I have, and in the context of our strong supports for a culture of rights, we caution against overly providing particular protections for the identity and ethos of both communities in Northern Ireland. Um, to regard aspects of culture as permanently characterizing particular groups can only serve to entrench an institutionalized difference by elevating the salience of these two communal blocks. Such a focus not only overlooks the rights of members of other groups, but also flattens the rich diversity within the groups and presents an obstacle to shared cultural celebration and exchange. And we hope you find this paper useful. So now I'd just like to point out that the comments I'll make from here on in are my own. Firstly, they don't represent those of Neil and Michael's. Um, and also you'll know I was the former co-chair of the FLAG's Identity, Cultural and Traditions Commission. So it's important that I stress these opinions in no way, way represents the findings of that commission. These, the opinions I give from here on in are, are, are from me. Um, so lastly, I want to make it clear that I'm not a lawyer and I do not have the expertise on a Bill of Rights um, that many of the people you have spoken to and will speak to have, not least my colleague, um, Professor Colin Harvey, who I think is, is going to follow me. My expertise, if I have some, is, a, is as a social anthropologist with knowledge and understanding of how culture and cultural identity and notions like community work. And as somebody who's worked for 30 years on issues of contested cultural identities um, and, and the development of better social cohesion. So I suppose that's really where my expertise comes from. And as such, um, there are many better than me in answering the question of how a Bill of Rights in Northern Ireland might improve the access to human rights. However, I do believe that not enough was done after 1998 to develop symbolic representations of the agreement and the attempt to bring peace, equality and justice for all. I do believe a Bill of Rights for Northern Ireland would have symbolically underpinned a sense of citizenship for everyone in Northern Ireland, and I do believe that's important. So I suppose the comments I have to make in some way uh, concern how symbolically important that Bill of Rights is, as opposed to how it might function, which is other people's expertise. And, th and that's me for an opening statement. Professor, thank you very much um, and thanks for, for the statement that you provided to us in, in written form. It was uh, short and snappy and very easy to follow and, and uh, interesting as well. So thanks for that. Um, I suppose I just want to draw on one of the, the first um, comments that you made there was around, and I know that the paper focuses on this culture of rights and you referred there to the importance of rights being um out in the open that, that people are aware of their rights and are able to access the rights. And that brings me on, I mean, the question that I would have, obviously, we're seeing now we're in the, literally this week, we've had the release of the Mother and Baby Homes report for the North. Uh, for ago, we had the same report for the 26 counties and there there's been lots of commentary around that. But we know that the reason why these institutions existed and the reason why, for a large part, many people within society either Either, either actively um, helped to, to foster that environment or else turned a blind eye to it was because we did live in, in a society where church and state her, had corroborated to, to have sort of institutionalized misogyny as, as a, hmm. a, a method of controlling people, basically, and, and that was the policy and, and the mindset. So following on from that, we're obviously in the space today where we still have rights deficits, particularly for the two groups that were predominantly affected by, by those particular institutions, women and children. And I wondered if you would if you would comment on that notion of a right that exists and, and is in the law, but people can't access. So I'm thinking of women's health care at the minute. We have issues mm -hmm. with with um, provision of women's health care in the north that is there in a legislative framework, but can't be accessed by people on the ground. 
Yeah, I suppose this is something that was this, this key for me when I've looked at these things over the over the years, and that is as important. I mean, we can we could discuss whether you have a, a Bill of Rights for Northern Ireland or whether we use um, the European Convention or the Act as appears in the in the UK. We, could, we obviously those becomes issues, but it seems to me the key is that people are able to access those rights and and equally important to understand those rights so that it becomes a part of our society that 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 people know the sorts of rights that they have and feel confidence in it and 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 to me that in underpins all sorts of ideas of citizenship it tells us something that we perhaps need to improve in our education system it tells us also about how we need to talk about our society, and that's true of all of us, academics, politicians, everybody that, that needs to needs to embed those idea of rights in. And, and you can see examples, I think, where that has worked quite well. I mean, I've looked at policing over the years, and I think um, the application of rights in policing in Northern Ireland, not without its problems, but has been has has been part of the um success of reform in those areas um so 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 it's about it's about thinking about how that access and confidence comes from and the resourcing and i'd, I'd just lastly say one of the difficulties is that is that different groups within our society feel differently about human rights um and because of I mean, you mentioned a number of very significant groups, but if we even look at the, you know, the, what I might call the political communities or the political groups in our society, they have experienced the importance of rights in different ways. All right. And for what we could go over the history of a bit, but probably the nationalist community have seen them in one way, the unionist community have seen them in another way. And it seems to me that we also need to think about, I don't know, rectifying the way rights are viewed and some thoughts need to be given to that sort of area as well. Mute button and, and me, I, I touched it too lately. Thank you. No, I, I take on board everything that you're saying. And I think that's that's key when we're having this conversation. You know, rights can be seen as an abstract notion. And until people are aware of, you know, how how exactly the rights would impact them or, or what they have access to or what they should have access to. Following on from that, and you've, you've spoken obviously there about the culture of, um, of rights. Um, and I, I wonder... If you would, if you would give us some idea around how we can ensure that people view rights not as a zero sum argument mm. that you know if one person has an increase in their rights or is helped to access yeah. a particular right that another group because to me rights are for everyone are universal and everyone should be playing on a, a level playing field. And and, and therein and therein comes the difficulty because very often when people claim rights. Um, they claim it almost as if it's an absolute. So they say, I have the right to do this or I should have the right to do that. Whereas, of course, um, within a legal system, those rights exist as part of uh, a balance. Uh, and and I think I think the the important that's where education and understanding comes in. That's where we need to start thinking about how those things work and and I mean that 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 improves when you see the functioning of it. So to, to give the most obvious example, when I started doing my research, I was all over parades, and that was a very good example, I think, of an area where where the rights the, the rights would, would would and should and could be so important in helping us through those problems. However, they are more complicated than simply. Um, I have the right to parade or I have the right to deny you the right to parade. There, there, there is a complexity to it. I do think if you see that, if you see those things being worked out over time, and in some senses, I think this has been true, uh, people be can begin to trust in a system um, uh, and begin to understand how those various checks and balances uh, balances work and that I think is when when if you like a culture of rights is becoming successful brilliant um th thanks thanks for that and this is my last question and I don't want to over egg the pudding or or go over a rehash old ground here but just drawn back from there 
uh, I know that a lot of the conversations that we've had, particularly around socioeconomic rights, and even in terms of the earlier remarks I made around healthcare rights, and I'm thinking of um, communities like the trans community in the north who technically have a legal right um, to, to gender identity services that, that aren't fulfilled at the minute. And one of the things that we hear is that you know, if we have these things instated in a Bill of Rights and written there in legislation, that you end up raising people's expectations because they feel that they should have access to a right. And then when, you know, the reality of resourcing or budgeting or any of those things come into to play, they end up not being able to access the right. And my thinking of that is always that, you know, that should be, you know, we should be striving to achieve those things and trying to, to dismantle the barriers and, and how can we find workarounds to ensure that people do access the rights as opposed to saying, well, we can't do that right now, so we're going to forget about it. I just wondered if you had comments on that. I, I think I would... You know, again, I'm not I'm not the lawyer, but my feeling, having watched this process over 20 years, and in a sense, the failure of the, the process of trying to get a bill of rights, is that is that the key area to looking at rights is is access and understanding. Um, the, the, the 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 period of trying to come up with a bill of rights in Northern Ireland, I think, in a way, has been hampered by understandably people wanting to get everything into that Bill of Rights to, to, so that it becomes a space where really important um, uh, parts, contested parts of our society, you mentioned ones around gender and sexuality, are played out. The difficulty is that I don't think coming up with a Bill of Rights, you can solve all those problems. It, it, in the Bill of Rights. So the danger has become, and I wonder whether the process previously has fallen, totally understandably fallen into that trap, Hello. is that you try and solve every problem through that through that process. So I wonder, and I, and I say, let's put this forward as not a lawyer, whether a, a, a simpler Bill of Rights or a more basic Bill of Rights is important, and it's the accesses and processes thereafter, the legal system, that begin to build our, 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 um, our culture of rights, if that's helpful. Thank you very much, Professor Brian. I think Mark has joined the meeting. Mark, maybe you're not on mute, are you? We've got a wee bit of... Sorry about that, Chair. Sorry. You're 110, you're right. I was calling me just, just, he was looking for directions to the vaccination centre. <laughs> oh, right. oh, well, brilliant that he's, that he's getting that. Um, I'm going to pass now to the Vice Chair, to Mike. Chair, thank you very much. And uh, Dominic, thanks, thanks for engaging with Hi, us. Mike. Um, re reading your, your, your briefs are leading me to <clears throat> the area of the potential for unexpected, unintended consequences. Yeah. Uh, you know, I'm thinking, you know, you're saying that human rights are are better when it's about the state rather than trying to resolve issues between conflicting communities. And in fact, that group or communal rights can actually uh, exacerbate the divisions within, within communities. Could you expand on that? Please, Dominic. Well, yes, I'm... I'm... We, we have particular circumstances in Northern Ireland which the agreement... Um, and legislation since has attempted to alleviate, all right? And in doing so, it identifies, in our case, two particular groups, uh, nationalists and unionists, and attempts to try and deal with it. And understandably, our legal system uh, has to try and do that. I think, I think that's what makes us different. But you, we could have an interesting discussion discussion about it making us different from the rest of the United Kingdom and the rest of the Republic of Ireland, which opens up some um, some nice debates, I think. Um, however, there are dangers in drawing upon, uh, in attempting to detail um, the rights attested to both groups in too much detail, all right? So to, to start to think about nationalists having a culture, for example, and unionists having a culture, all right? When in actual fact, the two groups, broadly speaking, share the same culture. Culturally, they're, they're, they're almost identical, if you like, all right? What they share is, 
what they have is different cultural identities. And that, that's, that's a different thing. So they have aspects within those which they see as important, but inevitably, since it defines what their group have, come a part of contestation. And I suppose what I'm warning against is making, um, making a Bill of Rights overly specific about all of those things. And, and I do so because... Those things change over time. As an anthropologist, culture is not static. What groups feel is important at any one point isn't static. It changes over time. So that I, what, I'm, what I'm suggesting is not that you shouldn't have things that protect um, these b groups, all right, absolutely, broadly based on individual rights, but one should be careful of having an over-detailed set of rights connected to cultural identity, specific areas of cultural identity, to, if, if that makes a, a, a bit of sense. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to just expand on the identity piece because, as you know, because the Belfast Agreement says yeah. you can be British or Irish or both. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I would probably be in the group that would support the, the John Hewitt multiple identity, you know, Ulsterman, yeah. Irish, British, European. Yeah. And, of course, Hewitt then explained why that was important. He said, if you deny me any part of that mix, you diminish who I am. And, yeah. and I would suggest there are a lot of people in Northern Ireland who feel that Brexit diminished their multiple identity by denying their sense of Europeanness. Yes. So if we protect all that in the Bill of Rights... And, and we take that logic to the nth degree, would that actually have made Brexit illegal? <laughs> the extended would have denied people's sense of Europeanness. For Mike, you, you, you're going into you're going into a, some legal stuff that I think are beyond are beyond my expertise. But what I think you're you're absolutely right on is that is that cultural identity is complex. And I mean, we could talk about even look at unionism and as, as you know, those those within unionism that see themselves as Irish and unionist. And there are those that see themselves as definitely not Irish. And that tells us that tells us an important thing about the way social groups work. Those those cultural identities are complex and therefore difficult to pin down legally. And let me let me give one example of, 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 of that and how it's difficult. If we were to take parades legislation and we to, we to look at what's in the parades legislation, it says things like uh, parade cannot kind of take, I don't remember the exact words, dependent upon the impact upon the life of that community. All right. And that seems a quite sensible thing. We've got to work that out. Of course, until you try and work out what we mean by community. All right. And then it starts to become a lot more important. And we've had legal cases on around the parades issue as what is meant in that legislation by community. So I suppose what I'm suggesting is I think I think on your British and Irish thing, it's important to have a legislative underpinning to a sense of citizenship, a right to be uh, Irish and British in that legal sense. What I would worry about is anything that restricts the um, uh, the diversity within those groups of people to be both and or and other, if you like. That's where I think you, one's got to be careful to not to be overly prescriptive in how one looks at that. Thank you, maybe. Mike, you're muted. Just... Oh, sorry. I'll just say that's very interesting, Dominic. Thank you very much. And thank you, Chair. No problem. That happens to me all the time, too. You have to, you have to hit the E button twice. Carol had indicated next, and then Paula. Okay. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Dominic. Okay. Um, I suppose, in just following on from what you said, my question would be. Well, my assumption is that equality legislation is also very, very important. Um, and as you know, we don't have a single Equality Act as as, a, as England does. Um, so you, in your opinion, um, should there be equality legislation within the Bill of Rights? 
Again, I'm going to be a bit of a cop out, Carolyn, in the sense that I, I'm not sure my expertise would allow me to say exactly how that would work within the Bill of Rights. But what I would say is that the protection for the groups that we're talking about, both the, if you like, the political communities who are central to the agreement, uh, and but to all groups, I think, I personally think, revolve around sense of equality. I think you know, I have to think societies are better if they can be made more equal. Um, and and one of the papers that was written, um, I don't know sure it was one of your research colleagues for that I looked at for your committee, uh, sort of identifies um, some principles that it says are in the Good Friday Agreement, which should be written in. Um, and one of them was equality. One was mutual respect, protection for civil, political, social, and economic, cultural rights, cultural tolerance, and nonviolence. And I sort of read those, and I thought that that quite well sums up what you need to feel are in a Bill of Rights, um, rather than the the particular defining of cultural identities. I think that so so if in that sense, I think an answer to your question is I do think equality is central to getting to to, to, to to moving forward on this. I think if people feel that they have rights and that they have equal access to those rights, then then regardless of the state we're in, you have people who feel they're citizens of those that place. And I suppose uh, well, it's more a political commentary than a question for yourself, but the reason I ask it is probably on the premise that you've said it's about knowledge and access to rights, mm. and that in itself became very political. But the fact that people have had the access, legal redress through the denial of rights is why we're, we're here, frankly, in my opinion. But the question I would have is, and the, the very firmly held belief I have is equality trumps uh, good relations all day long, mm. you know, and that's in legislation as it is. And some, and sometimes, okay, and yeah. sometimes it's, in my opinion, it's politically expedient to put the good relations above equality because dealing with denial of rights is too contentious. Mm. So that's why I ask the question. Um, the rest of it, in my opinion, is you know it's all open to interpretation and and it needs to be very definitive so that's where i completely agree with you yeah so when you're defending and then you're leaving things out then that's where people are going to feel aggrieved yeah so for example you've got the women's sector who felt that they were left out um and others and we had a very huh, interesting briefing last week by the Human Rights Commission on horizontal rights uh, and vertical, yeah. <laughs> you know, so uh, like, like terms I don't know about at all. But for me, um, everything just goes back to equality. If you feel that citizens feel that there's a sense of equality and, and that there is genuine inclusive, mm. then, um, you know, that, that for me is the sound of everything else comes from that. I, I think Thank I would... Sir. Yeah, I, th I think I, Carol, I think I would want to try and find a way of understanding how good relationships work with equality, and I, and I suppose I would probably take your point that equality is is what's most important here. But I, I nevertheless think that we have an issues within our society, and we could go into historical reasons for those, uh, and and they need to be they need to be dealt with and understood. All right. And part of those feeds into what we call good relations. Um, and I, I do think I do think it's not it's not an easy balance and relationship to have. And maybe the legislation, Section 75 legislation sort of has it right now. In some senses, it does slightly unevenly uh, balance it. And the skills, the important things for politicians to do and for people to think about it is to try and get that balance balance right because i do believe that whatever society we're in we need to we need to work on the relationships within this society carl is that you is that you carl Sorry, not a lot here. I could go all day on this, but we'll just leave it there. <laughs> okay. No problem. Paula, I'll pass to you now. 
Um, and thank you, Chair, and thank you, Dominic, for your um, presentation so far. I just wanted to um, look at the sort of terms of reference of the committee, and uh, in many ways it's around the, the wording around the particular circumstances for Northern Ireland, and I just wanted to see if you could give any sort of broad thoughts around that and then maybe hone it down into your areas of, of specialism around parades and flags, and I don't want you to try and ge or undermine the work of the Fict Commission, but just a more general commentary around how we could grapple with those issues through this process. Thank you. Yeah, I, I think, it, uh, Paula, I think it's so interesting to try and work out what's particular about Northern Ireland. And I actually think the way the question has been set up for your committee to look at is really quite good. And, and you know, I, I, again, I read some of the papers that have been produced uh, around that question and I thought they that, that have been produced and I thought they were really good I thought they were really interesting how they started to, to identify because I would I would from a, a sociological point of view I would absolutely say that Northern Ireland has a very distinctive um, uh, social and political culture born out of what I would call ethnic conflict and we know from around the world that when we have that sort of conflict we need it, it drives certain sorts of behaviors certain sort of way, ways of being the structure of politics in a way that ne it, it needs it needs to be looked after in particular in particular ways and in that sense we are undoubtedly a different sort of society than much of the rest of the United Kingdom not totally but we have differences and interestingly we're different from much of the republic of ireland and it seems to me that those relationships that we have are not going to leave us anytime soon so that we are different in the sense that we have to pay cognizance to all of the unravels from that so for example it means that we tend to have more contests over culture now as we've watched in america and we've watched in britain over the last year they all have their contests and i've done some work in the southern united states and it's fascinating some some of the similarities when you have those sort of divisions you have forms of cultural contestation and those symbols become more important than they probably should do in societies where you have less division and that means that whilst the conflict is not about those symbols, all right, the, the differences are not about the symbols, but the differences are very real political differences, which are understood emotionally through those symbols. And for me, that's why we have to start thinking about the best ways of mitigating and trying to get around those um, contested symbols, and and that involves having good legislation. And I'm going to suggest here that it doesn't necessarily appear in a Bill of Rights, because I think that can make it too complicated. We just need good legislation, good access to legislation, and good understanding of rights. And what you also need is you need other forms of social cohesion. So it's as much about all of those events, all of the things that we do together as it is about those things that divide us. And if you, if you increase the amount of social cohesion that you have in your city or in Northern Ireland, then, then I think you're probably able to deal with those contested times better, uh, rather than and at times, as we know, it's almost appeared like it's gonna pull us apart, all right? Um, so so, so that, that would be my broad approach is that you look at good mechanisms for dealing with that, that contestation, but equally look at what we share, what gives us cohesion to be able to deal. And in some senses, that allows us to have our differences more easily, if that makes sense. Yeah, just, just to follow on, when you first started um, responding there, I was thinking about, we've, we've sort of been battering about um, the potential for a really robust preamble to our Bill of Rights to sort of set that that context. But I think as you went on that, I thought, I'm not sure we will ever agree the wording for it, because we might <laughs> there might be a contest about the sort of the emphasis about it. So have you any thoughts in terms of how we contextualise a Bill of Rights? Or should we agree with that? <laughs> well, I'm not going to give any any great secrets away, but when we were writing the report for the Commission on Flags, Identity and Cultural Tradition, we had many a discussion over robust, robust preambles, and I can speak from experience that it's difficult to do, and I might feel that I can do it, but we can we, we won't even go into 
you know, the minute we start terming this place, we start getting into to, to difficulties, which is why I tend to think that a broad visionary statement about the rights that all human beings have that we should look towards tends to be a better way of going about it rather than trying to discuss how we got where we are now. So in a sense, if, 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 if I'm thinking this through, it's probably better to look to a future than it is to try and run over the past, if, if that makes sense. That makes perfect sense. Thank you. Okay. I don't think any of the other members have um, raised their hand, but if I bring you in alphabetically, I know Mark is on the call. Have you got any? No. You, no questions? Not, not just my curiosity. You're 100%. What about Michelle? Uh, no, thank you. It's generally been covered. Um, I suppose it really was just um, the, the point had been made. And actually, thank you very much for the presentation. Um, it was in relation to how you rectify the way in which rights are viewed. And, and you have covered that sort of fairly well throughout. Um, and I suppose I had sort of point, written a few notes in relation to, you know, are we now looking at from your perspective about a high level set of principles as opposed to something which is very specific and drilling down into particular groups? I, Michelle, I, I think that would be my broad position. And I'd also say that I think it's important to look at groups and communities within our society that um, for whatever reason, whatever historic reason, feel like rights are not for them or they have deficits around it. And I think trying to work out how how we end up with a sense of us all having rights and all having access is, is just as important as, if you like, what those rights look like. OK, thank you. Okay, I think then everyone has had the opportunity to ask uh, questions. So, Professor Brown, I, I want to at this point thank you very much for joining us again this afternoon <laughs> via via webcam. I know we're we're in strange times and we are. We don't get any more used to these meetings, no matter how many of them we have to do. So, uh, thank you very much for for your presentation. And be your best of luck with your work as well. <laughs> thank you very much, good man. We, we'll let you take your ease now right. and we move on to the, the next agenda item. Thank you. Okay, I don't know what the crack is. Can we bring Professor Colin Harvey in? Hello. 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 Can you hear me? We can hear you, Professor. Thank you very much for joining us. So, uh, members, the next item on our agenda this afternoon is a, is a briefing from Fr Professor Colin Harvey from, from Queen's University as well. Um, we have uh, got uh, clerk's memo uh, in the pack as well as a, a draft bill of rights from Professor Harvey and an excerpt from, from an article that or a, a piece that he had written along with Dr. Ann Smith. So, Professor, I'll not delay any longer if you want to begin your, your briefing. Well, thank you very much, Chair and committee members. Uh, delighted for the opportunity this afternoon to present to you and always hear your questions and hopefully respond to, to you as well. Um, really very much welcome the establishment of this committee. You know, I, I'm delighted to see the momentum that is back in this conversation about uh, the Bill of Rights. And that's great to see. And I really wish you well in, in your work. You know, the renewed focus on this, both within the assembly and I think also within wider civil society is really very heartening to see. And I suppose I should declare at the start that uh, I've been involved in this like, like many people here for many, many years. I was a commissioner on the Human Rights Commission uh, at the time the advice was submitted in December 2008. So I was involved in that drafting process uh, and had really have been involved involved in the process for the last 20 years uh, or more so of a lot, an interest in the work that you're doing and hopefully a successful outcome. Also, what I've provided is some research that Dr. Ann Smith from Ulster University and myself have been doing, published in the Fordham International Law Journal there in December, which we hope will be helpful to your reflections and thoughts. I thought what it might be useful today for me to do is say something about context say something about process, a uh, few words about content briefly, and then some final reflections, and I'll be as, as quick as I can. 
think first of all, in context, uh, I want to make absolutely clear uh, this afternoon, this is not a blank page discussion. There's an enormous amount of work that has already been done and you're very fortunate indeed to the, be the beneficiaries of that existing work. It'll make your job much easier because there's work being done which you can make active use of and I encourage you to do, do so. But really why I say that is I want to take the opportunity this afternoon to pay tribute to all those people across this society who over the last 20 years have given up their time to participate in this process. I think we need to demonstrate respect for all those contributions throughout those decades to this conversation. And hopefully what we're doing in the time ahead is building on those. We're not starting from a blank page. In terms of context, I'm going to mention the B word. I think there's probably a lot of B words, at the moment, but one B word is Brexit and the impact of Brexit on uh, this society. And obviously when we're reflecting on human rights and equality now, we need to pay attention to the protocol, the Ireland, Northern Ireland protocol, and the fact that there are rights and equality protections in that protocol in itself, very interesting development. Obviously global and local public health emergency, which is putting a major focus on, for example, the right to healthcare. The sense in which I think there's been progress and an appetite for the development of rights in devolved settings and also across these islands. Uh, while we can focus on uh, the negatives and the lack of progress, it's been interesting to watch, for example, the sort of work that's being done in Scotland to advance the human rights and equality agenda there. And there are other examples too. We know that the Conservative Party has had a long-standing obsession with the Human Rights Act, uh, not in a good way. Uh, it's previously been talking about repealing and replacing the Human Rights Act, and now it wants to update the Human Rights Act. And as you're all aware, there's a review of the Human Rights Act currently ongoing at, at the moment. And so that's a, a significant context, I think, to your work. But obviously, the work that we're doing here is very much building on the Human Rights Act. Uh, supplementing the European Convention Human Rights, uh, Human Rights Act Plus, if you like. Also in terms of context, uh, you're all aware that there are larger uh, constitutional conversations ongoing at the moment across these islands and rights are playing a part in those discussions too. Okay, secondly, I thought it might be helpful to say something about process. I suspect as committee members, you've had a, an inordinate number of briefings on all this, so you know this uh, backwards already. But obviously, the remit for the process is to be found in the Belfast Good Friday Agreement, uh, which I won't recite here, but I think at this point I probably could re recite with my eyes closed at this point. A lot of us have been grappling with it over a long, long period of time. Obviously, that job was given to the Northern Ireland Human Rights Commission. The process was launched on the 1st of March uh, 2000. Uh, the Commission submitted its final advice to uh, the British government in December uh, 2008. 10th of December 2008, Human Rights Day. Uh, in between, there was a lot of uh, debate and discussion, agreement, some disagreement. Also, the Bill of Rights Forum that was established as a result of the St Andrews Agreement, which brought political parties and civil society together to discuss all of these. So ultimately, in process terms, the Commission's advice was submitted on the 10th of December 2008. And I think that that advice, you know, envisaged in the Good Friday Agreement as really the key step in the process uh, needs to be seriously dusted off uh, and looked at. Uh, committee members will be aware we live in a society where there's often a lot of talk about documents. Uh, sometimes they're not read as thoroughly as they might be. I think it's time to engage in a much more serious way with the content of that advice. And again, I'd like to pay tribute to Monica McWilliams, who was a chair of the commission at that time, and all those who participated in the conversation leading up to that final advice. The Northern Ireland office, as you know, responded in 2009. It decided to issue a consultation on a, a limited number of the proposals we advanced. 
Uh, there's been a number of descriptions of the Northern Ireland Office response to the advice. Uh, regarded as rather dismissive. But interesting to note again, dusting off that response, there were a range of areas where they thought progress might be made. The Human Rights Commission responded itself in 2010. The NIO published responses to the consultation again in 2010. Really pr procedurally, which you'll all be aware, uh, the, the process stalled and was stuck not an uncommon feature of the equality and rights debate in this society, uh, things being stalled and stuck. And until a new decade, new approach, really the process was stalled. And really the establishment of this committee has seen renewed momentum for the process. And obviously you have your own terms of reference and you'll be reporting in 2022, but you'll be aware that for many people, who've participated in this process over the last two decades, they're looking to you now to really be the final phase, if you like, in a process that will lead finally to delivery on a Bill of Rights for the society. Because I think there's still a view which I share very profoundly that uh, we need a Bill of Rights and we need the sort of Bill of Rights that the Commission anticipated in its advice. I'll just end with some thoughts on third content. You'll have had briefings and you'll be aware of the proposals that the Commission made. I would underline again that the, the, the seriousness and dedication and thought that went into that document. Again, your conversation is not a blank page discussion. There's a risk in this process. I think there's a real risk in this process of people going round in circles on content because a lot of the content for the discussion is already there. People have thought long and hard about how you try and resolve some of the tensions you're grappling with in terms of the particular circumstances of the society and uh, an ambitious human rights set of proposals. So I would just urge you to, which I'm sure you're all doing already, paying close attention to what's gone before, the Commission's advice and associated work. I could cite a range of content-based issues, but just following on actually from the previous discussion, you know, I, I really do think, look again at what the Commission advised on culture. Look again at what the Commission advised on issues of identity around the agreement. You know, we've seen many debates in recent years over core aspects of the Belfast Good Friday Agreement that haven't been incorporated into domestic law, policy and practice. Well, guess what? Uh, during the Bill of Rights process, many people spotted that and they actually recommended proposals for change that would have made a difference. Yeah on issues of social and economic rights as well. Again, the Commission recommended a range of social and economic rights be included in that advice. Obviously on content, uh, it only seems like yesterday, but it was 2008, <laughs> it was a long time ago. So there, there is a discussion, I think a correct discussion that that was pre-Brexit, uh, you know, we're, how many years on are we now? We're a long way on from that. So there's a chance to reflect on that advice, to do some updating. But I think, you know, as a commissioner who was involved in that process, involved in drafting and su submitted the advice, you know, I stand by the scale of ambition. Uh, people in this society deserve a first class Bill of Rights, I think. I still think that. Why would you want to give people a second class Bill of Rights. You want the best for everyone in this society, uh, so you want the best for a Bill of Rights as well. So just to conclude then, I think first of all, what I've repeated is much work has been done, therefore your task is much lighter. You'll be delighted to hear that. Right? Uh, there's a lot that has been done that you can build upon. I'd also really underline today, you know, it's been a great privilege for me particularly as an academic, speaking in an academic capacity today, we have enormous experience and expertise in our society, in civil society. 
the people who are the experts around these questions. So I would urge the committee to, you know, involve yourselves in collaboration and engagement. Everybody's talks about co-design, right? But we have so such deep and rich experience across civil society. We have some of the, the best NGOs around. We have some great experience. Use it. That experience in civil society and expertise can help. So wide and deep collaboration and engagement. Harness the expertise that is out there. Make use of it. We are very, very fortunate to have it in this society. Listen to what has been said. A lot of people have been in your shoes on many occasions over the last two decades. Many of you have been in the room for those conversations as well. Listen to what has been said, take it on board. And, and ultimately, what I would really end by doing is too many issues of rights and equality in this society are stalled or there's political stalemate. You know, Please let your report be a report that shows a constructive way forward for this discussion. What we do not need here, and I don't need to tell any of you this this afternoon, we do not need another stalled process in the area of equality and human rights. I don't underestimate the task you have. I wish you well in your work. I'm delighted to see the momentum around the conversation and look forward to our conversation now. So thank you very much, Chair. Professor Harvey, thanks. Thanks very much for that, um, uh, for, for that overview. Uh, I, I'm laughing when you're talking there about 2008 and and how, how much involvement you had at that stage. 2008, I was doing my GCSEs, but we're, so, we're still here having the same conversation. So it just, it's, when you're talking about how many years ago it, it was, it, it does feel a long time ago. I don't want to, to rehash um, anything that, you, that you've already covered, um, but I just, I wondered if you would touch upon one of the, the, the subjects that you covered in the in the piece that we got from yourself and, and Dr. Smith in the, the second uh, chapter or, or section, you refer to the fact that a Bill of Rights are put in place to uphold rights and facilitate political accountability and good governance. And one of the conversations that we've been having when we've had the different presentations is, you know, people have concerns that a Bill of Rights would act as some sort of a impediment on political decision making or on the government of the day or what they're what they're mandated to do. And my view is that a Bill of Rights should be an accountability mechanism and should, you know, be the golden standard to which governments should to tr should try to, to act and maintain. I, I want wondered if you would if you would touch on that thank you very much chair it's a good question starting point really in the answer is that a bill of rights ultimately is a framework it's a framework and at times it'll, it'll be a fairly general framework of rights protection ultimately about enriching democratic life and democratic accountability and good governance just want to make clear, I have, and I've always had enormous respect for politicians, uh, for those who enter public life and for the work that you do. And, you know, change invariably happens through politics. I think ultimately when you're in a courtroom, it's an indication of failure. In a sense, what a Bill of Rights will try to do what human rights provisions tries to do is that you are preventing that in the first place by in a sense building it in mainstreaming it if you like at an early stage in all processes in public life whether that's in the work of the executive the assembly or in public bodies throughout the society so that w in a sense we don't end up in, in courtrooms, I probably shouldn't say that as an academic lawyer, you know, but, but ultimately it's about improving and enriching uh, democratic life. I think too often this discussion is pitched as a discussion around uh, politicians and judges. I, I think that gets it wrong. Ultimately, it's about making sure that when we're making decisions, whether that's in the executive and the assembly, or any public body throughout the society, 
that these rights are are hardwired into the way that we approach decision making in the public sphere. They're not just about arguments in courtrooms. Thank you. And I suppose I, I would share a lot of the, the views that you've put forward there. I wonder then, uh, and I know um, you, you've referred to, to Brexit and obviously we're seeing the impact of Brexit at the minute. And one of the big things that are coming out of that is is a massive uh, question and conversation around the constitutional um, situation and, you know, the, the future of the United Kingdom and the North's place and Irish unity and, and all of those things. And I, I don't have to, I think, declare an interest uh, there as a Sinn Féin MLA, obviously, that my, my view on that is is well known but I suppose one of the the things and when we had the presentation from Albie Sachs when we were talking about you know rights for different groups and how you could break down the barriers um to for people who oppose the idea of a bill of rights or who are reluctant to see a bill of rights implemented I wonder if you could um give us your view on how a bill of rights and how putting rights into legislation could help with people of a British identity or people who identify as unionists or Northern Irish. If we move into a position where we do have Irish reunification, that that could be a protection for, for people who, who, who don't want to see that happen. Thank you very much, Chair. You know, the, the clue to human rights, the clue to a Bill of Rights, has always been in the title. Right? It, it, it's illogical uh, to say a Bill of Rights is just about Colin Harvey or a Bill of Rights is just about one community or other community because it will protect everyone in this place if enacted. And I think that can't be said often enough. These are human rights that belong to absolutely everyone and they're owned by no one that's essential. Obviously, in terms of the Good Friday Agreement, there's a specific remit there for a Bill of Rights. The process is involved, as I said, the Commission's advice. Now, what is really striking about the Commission's advice is it tries to do a number of things. It tries to recognize that we live in a post-conflict society where there are two main communities with divergent national aspirations, but also places that in the context of a broader human rights conversation. And it's interesting to see the way in which, for example, culture and identity protections are written into the advice that the Commission proposed, in addition to all the other things as well. I think what a Bill of Rights does is it provides guarantees and assurances to everyone and to all communities, whatever constitutional or other change or turbulence may be coming in the future. I suppose one concept in the Good Friday Belfast Agreement that is perhaps worth just reminding ourselves on today is the notion of equivalence. If there were to be change here, obviously there has to be equivalence in terms of the new arrangements. So everything won now in terms of protections will be carried in to any new arrangements as well and the assurances and guarantees that will come with it. But ultimately, I think we're talking about the Good Friday Agreement process. We're talking about recommendations that are already there that have acknowledged some of those concerns. You know, it's about protecting people, giving guarantees and assurances for all communities, whatever comes in the future. You know, it might have been nice to have that Bill of Rights as we faced into the turbulence of Brexit. And who knows we may, where we might be going in the future. So if I was thinking about assurances, guarantees and protections, I would be dusting off a lot of the work that was done on the Bill of Rights to date. Thank you. Uh, I suppose my last question, and if you're watching the last interchange you'll have seen, I, I asked um, Professor Brown about this as well. You have referred there to um, all too often rights and particular um, rights that may be, may be deemed controversial or people have political objection to that they end up uh, being basically denied to people because of political stalemate or 
or, or, or politicking, basically. And I know, obviously, we have the situation at the minute where we have different particular healthcare care um, rates that people can't access because of political decision making and the um you know women's women's health care in particular that that was legislated for last year and uh, we also have gender identity services that are, are currently unavailable um I, I wondered if you would give us your view as to how a bill of rights could um rectify that well again th- thank you very much for the question start by saying that a bill of rights is a framework where other things will develop in and under that framework as well. And I think that's important to say. But what what has happened to our society is that too much pressure, in a sense, has been put on the politics here. You know, there's a reason why uh, the Belfast Good Friday Agreement talked about a Bill of Rights. And one of the reasons for doing that, in a sense, to take the heat out of some of our politics. You know, one of the problems is that many issues get stuck, stalled, or not implemented in human rights terms. And having a Bill of Rights, the sort of Bill of Rights anticipated uh, by proposals thus far, in a sense, takes the heat out of issues. It takes them out of the political arena as well, puts them in a human rights framework. I suppose in relation to your specific question, you know, I don't need to highlight here, we're very aware the way in which this society has fundamentally failed people in human rights terms. And obviously we're seeing this week uh, women and children, the scandalous abuses of rights, the failures actually across this island, the shameful treatment of women and children. Now, a Bill of Rights isn't going to solve all the problems of this society, but it gives us the right human rights-based starting point for the conversations. Absolutely. Thanks, Professor Harvey. And I know with the release of, of both those reports, North and South, over the course of the past month, we're, we're reminded of the human rights abuse that, that were carried out by different organisations and by the state. And I suppose it's it's a good it's it's almost you know a, a good reminder for us you know of, of the mistakes of the past and, and should be used probably to recalibrate and try to see how we can prevent those sorts of things happening in the future and that sort of that sort of um societal acceptance of denial of rights and 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 allowing those things to perpetuate but i'm i'm going to to leave it there and i'm going to pass now to the vice chair to mike chair thank you very much and uh, good afternoon colin thanks for engaging oh, with us um, can I say just by way of preface, I, I share your ambition that, that this committee and the report that we'll publish in a year or so will will move the debate on positively from, from where it was. Could, could I pick up on a couple of things? First of all, in terms of equivalence, I take it you're referring to the fact that in, in the agreement it says if we do something in this jurisdiction, then the government of Ireland has to look at it as well. Yeah, it's, it's one of the th- things that hasn't probably got enough attention in the discussion so far is that, you know, that any human rights gains that are made now would have to be replicated in any process of constitutional change here. And I'm just conscious Emma raised that question of obviously the current discussion around um, the referendums and all of that, that if we were to adopt a Bill of Rights here, uh, in the event of change, you know, we would be looking to that to be replicated in the south of Ireland as well. So, uh, you know, I think sometimes that's just a bit forgotten about, that mm-hmm. it's not an either or debate. You know, w- what is gained now in human rights terms will carry forward into other conversations, whatever they happen to be. Yeah, I think, I think you know, uh, when Judge Richard Humphreys gave his evidence, I got the impression that he he was a bit cautious about the idea that one jurisdiction would legislate in a way that would force the other jurisdiction uh, to bring in equivalent legislation. Well, ultimately, the the the, the logic of this discussion is that, that that nobody here should be disadvantaged in whatever constitutional decision is made, um, whether that's to remain within the UK or whether that's to opt for United Ireland, you know. So uh, the logical corollary of that is that um, if we adopt a a Bill of Rights 
along the lines anticipated, that needs to be carried forward into the conversation to, to come as well. Okay. Now, you, you said in your oral evidence there that you know it shouldn't be about arguments in courtrooms, but I think you're also concerned about judicial activism. Would that not be true? I'm concerned about the, the, the unbalanced either or nature of uh, the debate. It's not simply a debate about uh, the judges versus politicians. It's a debate about all elements of our society working together to ensure the values and a bill of rights are actively implemented. Obviously, the role of judges and the judiciary and lawyers is to uphold the rule of law. You know, you know, Mike, the argument around the Human Rights Act, you know, in some senses, the judges quite rightly say, we're doing what Parliament asked us to do, the legislators. So, so if you enact a Bill of Rights and lawyers seek to uphold the rights in it, you know, you can't really blame them. You know, that's their job. So, but I sometimes yeah. think that people neglect the extent to which, you know, you and this committee know the number of briefings and other uh, information you get around the rights implications of what you do in the Assembly and what ministers do in the executive. And that would be precisely the same with the Bill of Rights. You would be reflecting from day one, your advisors would be telling you as a policy was being developed, you know, the Bill of Rights implications of your policy. And I think if that's a preventative aspect of the discussion that's too often neglected, you know? Yeah, yeah. And, and yeah, okay, so judges uphold the rule of law, but, but they have to interpret it as well. So it yeah. is, as you say, it's important for us to make sure that uh, we mean what we say and we make it very clear and explicit. Yeah, no, I, 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 I absolutely ag agree with that, you know, in terms of, and again, I do think the Commission's advice from 2008 merits merits another look, you know. Yeah, well, that, that's my final question, Colin. And you know, I know that, that you've been saying that we need to move away from the old arguments. But to a certain extent, does that document from 2008 not represent old arguments in that, as you know, the, the unionist commissioners didn't sign up to it. I suppose what I'm trying to stress this afternoon, and I'm as aware as you all are, that, that really the key division down the years has been essentially party political. I have, you know, in a sense, between unionism and nationalism. What I'd like to underline today is that there's been a lot of work done there have been efforts to grapple with some of the issues that you're trying to grapple with in a credible way. And the material that has gone before needs to form part of that discussion. I think the Commission's advice, to me, remains invaluable. It's remarkable the number of other events you go to elsewhere that people do actually commend the work that was done in terms of trying to deal with a human rights instrument in the context of an ethno-nationally divided society, but in a wider human rights framework uh, as, as well. Look, Mike, we know the problem in the process thus far is political stalemate. And obviously your committee, I think, you know, it is great to see the work that you are doing and really hope that the committee and political parties on the committee will be able to find a constructive way forward in this debate. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll, I'll sign up to that, Colin, because I'm now into my 10th year at Stormont, uh, and I've seen enough political stalemate. <laughs> and, and, and I have faith in that this committee can find, can find a positive way forward over the next 12 months. Listen, thanks again for your engagement. Thank you, Mike. Okay, I know that Paula had her hand up. I'm not sure if... Yeah, I, I, Chair, thank you. I just wanted to um, ask Colin, thank you very much. My has been very, very interesting. It's around um, how do we ensure that this sort of the, the middle ground that is emerging, um, especially with the last number of election cycles in terms of people who don't necessarily identify as unionists or nationalists, how do we um, ensure that their voice is heard and that their aspirations for the future is reflected in a Bill of Rights? Thank you. Thank you very much, Paula. It's, it's a great question. One of the things that I tried to underline in the opening statement is that we are very, very fortunate indeed in this society to have remarkable range and depth of experience in civil society. 
And I think one of the challenges for the, the committee is how you can, in a sense, harness all voices in this society, including new voices in this society. Uh, I'm sure people have heard enough of people like me talking about a Bill of Rights. I want to hear new voices in this society talking about this conversation, hearing what the aspirations are for a Bill of Rights and the ambitions too. But I think the only way to do that really is to find ways to collaborate, engage with wider civil society here. To You're right, you know, what's the conversation in 2021? You know, not the conversation in 2000. And it, I think the only way to do that is try to make the process as participative as possible and engage with people and bring those voices into that conversation. But again, you know, where I started was, you know, people from across this society uh, participated and have participated in this discussion for the last 20 years. And I do think we need to respect that, commend that, and, you know, credit that and acknowledge that as well. There's a rich and deep body of work out there that you can draw upon that will reflect those concerns. And look, Paula, ultimately, you know, I'm repeating myself as sort of cliche alert here, but, you know, the clue to human rights, right? It's in the title. They're rights for everyone here. They belong to no one person, no one political party, and no one community. They're rights for everyone here. Um, sorry, just another one's coming to my head. Thank you for that. Um, a lot of what we're sort of picking up from different experts is around the judiciability of rights. And I've always been very concerned, having sat on the Bill of Rights Forum in 2007 and so on, that um, we build expectations of people that, you know, there will be a section in it for the disability, for the women, for children. And, you know, the last thing we need is to let people's hopes down. If we do produce a Bill of Rights and it fits on one page or two pages, you know, I think that a lot of people may not see their own particular sector, section of society in there. But at the same time, if we went down the, the road that we were in 2007, 2008, then a very expansive Bill of Rights then may not get political agreement. So have you any thoughts on, on how we present it and what really ultimately should be its contents? Well, again, it's a great question. Starting point would be, look, there's, we've had a discussion earlier about protections that, that, are, that are useless for people. We've had a discussion earlier about promises made that haven't been implemented here now. And no one wants a Bill of Rights for this society that people can't do anything about, <laughs> you know, that people can't go to court and say, ask a judge to actually uphold the rights that are there, and I've tried to frame that in a particular context. You know, so we want a, a bill of rights that's meaningful, that that you can enforce rights. And we've already mentioned areas at the moment where people are struggling to get their rights actually enforced in practice. The, the other thing to bear in mind is we have to be clear about expectations of what a bill of rights is. It will ultimately be a framework of protection, and you know from the briefings you've had from other organisations and individuals. Bills of rights are often quite generally drafted, you know, in quite open terms. Uh, and that needs to be underlined too. A Bill of rights will not protect uh, and will not solve, sorry, all the problems of this society. And also something I think that's neglected, just because you have a Bill of rights doesn't mean you won't have specific legislation in the future to enhance protections in particular areas. Uh, you know, so you might have, for example, a right to accommodation, housing in your Bill of Rights, but then you're going to have detailed housing legislation that maps out how that works in practical. So it's, it's not an either or. There'll be a framework, a sort of values-based statement. And, you know, I don't need to tell people in this committee how much does this place need a sort of coherent, comprehensive values-based commitment to human rights at the moment, but it won't solve all the problems. There'll be other legislation and things that will go further in the future as well. So it's just about managing that and being clear about it, what it can do and what it can't do as well. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Paula, um, I now have Carl and I know Mark is looking in as well. So Carl and then Mark. Hi, Colin, or Colin, sorry, thanks very much for your presentation. Um, 
So one of the things that I found really frustrating is that even in some of the commentary up until now, that, you know, it's still being, there's almost like a two camps to a bill of rights and, it, you know, that's still prevalent, which is disappointing. And for me, a bill of rights isn't like a program for government where you've got, you know, two big parties and then the part, other parties in between need to get in. You know, that's that's the difficulty in all this. But what I would really advocate is that you use the 2008 process for, as you say, there's a lot of work put into it. I believe it's been a go-to um, place for a lot of people like ourselves doing this work. But the issue still rests for me. It's still, it's a question that I asked Professor Brown, um, really in relation to equality legislation. Because we don't have a single Equality Act, you know, should we incorporate or have reference to equality legislation within a Bill of Rights? Thank you very much, Carol. That's uh a great set of questions. I'm tempted just to say yes <laughs> in answer to your, your 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 question. There's two things there. I think one thing is that the importance of talking to people in this society. I think sometimes we can walk ar around with caricatures and stereotypes of what's actually happening out there. Well, the remarkable thing. I remember when I was involved in the Human Rights Commission, the work of organizations like the Human Rights Consortium. When surveys was done, polling was done, the amount of support there is out there among people for a Bill of Rights and for issues such as social economic rights across all communities here is actually quite remarkable. So sometimes it's about listening to that evidence. So while there might be um, party political issues in relation to advancing that, you know, what really struck me during this process in the last 20 years is when you listen to what people want out there and actually on core well-being issues, on core bread and butter issues around social and economic protections, the message loud and clear when I was on the commission was people want social and economic guarantees around issues like housing, around issues like uh, work in terms of, um, you know, basic uh, socioeconomic uh, rights. So I think that's uh, important to underline, but also on equality. Look, again, the, the commission in its advice in 2008 had a what I think is quite a robust equality guarantee in the Bill of Rights. So I think any Bill of Rights to be credible needs to have an enforceable and robust equality guarantee. That doesn't rule out then the development of more comprehensive single equality legislation. Um, and again, single equality legislation joins a joins a list of things here that are, uh, I don't know, stuck. I don't know what the word is still, but uh, the Commission's advice ha had a an equality guarantee well worth looking at. An equality guarantee that is robust and enforceable uh, could usefully be part of any credible Bill of Rights, I think. And Chair, and again, you know, I, I'm really pleased to hear that. See, for me, um, I don't believe that human rights or equality, it belongs to everyone. You know, it's 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 universal. But obviously, you know, coming back to the real world, the fact that these discussions happened in the first place was because there was a denial of rights and it was institutionalised. And in fact, it was systemic. Um, and even just my own recent experience coming out of um, the Department for Communities and bringing forward proposals to reform housing, you know, there would have been, you know, if you had a, had a Bill of Rights or certainly stronger equality legislation, the housing inequality, particularly in Catholic areas, would have been certainly challenged and has been challenged in court. That may still happen over different issues, even with the Bill of Rights, because if people feel their rights have been denied, um, then they should have a redress and we all support that. But the worrying thing for me in this process is I'm still hearing, and I heard it at the last presentation, that there needs to be almost um, a rebooting of the legislation around equality 
and good relations. And I believe equality has primacy over everything else. So I, I am encouraged to hear you saying that there does need to be a strong reference, if not an inclusion. Um, and I'm just concerned that in the event that we try to cobble together a compromise, that um, it just becomes so diluted that no one recognizes themselves in it. And I just think, you know, the 2008 work for me has to be reflected in this new Bill of Rights as a minimum. Again, maybe if I just, you know, some of the earlier points, you, you, my view would be you, you can't have a credible Bill of Rights without a robust equality guarantee at the centre of it. And I think people here, as I hope I've made clear, deserve an ambitious, uh, ambitious human rights instrument. You know, why would you want to give a second, third, fourth class Bill of Rights to the people of the society? They deserve a lot better than that. I think on the it was great to see on the, the, the launch of the, the housing policy and the new approach to housing, it was really encouraging to see the extent to which human rights were mainstreamed, if you like, in that uh, approach. And I think that's a great example in a sense of, of what the future might look like, that, uh, that a minister standing up announcing a new policy would be paying attention to the Bill of Rights from day one, and it would be very, very helpful. I think the, the final point is I honestly believe and feel that this society has missed the absence of, you know, a Bill of Rights has been missed. I think some of the problems that we've experienced here, some of the log jams, stalemates, and other difficulties politically, that's put a lot of pressure on our political system, could have been resolved if we ha had had the sort of Bill of Rights anticipated in the advice from the Human Rights Commission. And it's really tragic, really, that that was never enacted. Okay, Carl, if that's you, I'm going to go now to Mark. Thank okay. you. Thank you, Chair. Carl sort of gives something to me there. Uh, some of the points she made were, were, were almost identical to those that I was, but it's good to see you again, Colony, even if you, you can't see me. <laughs> or maybe that's better for you. <laughs> yeah, I, I was going to start off, I suppose, by saying that. I concur 100% with you that everyone in this society does deserve a first-class uh, Bill of Rights. I find it interesting there when you spoke about <laughs> the renewed interest and vigour about the Bill of Rights, not just in the Assembly, but you said in, in civil society too. I was just wondering if I could ask you maybe where you've picked that up or how that's manifested itself, because I know now you spoke about, and Carl, this is where Carl crossed over into to what I'd been going to raise, spoke about how these things tend to be pitched at, at the judiciary or solicitors and politicians. But I, I've been heartened, I have to say, that through the consultation process, the amount of ordinary and inverted commas people or, or, or groups on the ground who've been contacting me to, you know, to, to share their thoughts with me prior to responding to the consultation. Thank you very, thank you very much, Mark. Um, Again, great, great questions. The, really repeating the point about civil society here, we're very fortunate to have a lot of experience. The real experts in this society around human rights and civil society here. I think Brexit um, has refocused discussions on this debate. Uh, the turbulence around Brexit, the anxieties that have been caused around Brexit, the fears and worries that people have, at, at times like that, people are looking at, you know, more comprehensive guarantees. They're looking for stability, assurances, and guarantees in a human rights framework. And I think it's not surprising to me that in the current context that people are revisiting the Bill of Rights conversation to say, well, why don't we have these sorts of pr protections copper fastened in law so long after the Belfast Agreement? so long after the commission submitted its advice, uh, where are they? Uh, and I think people are right to say that. I think Brexit's been a big part of that discussion. But again, Mark, I think my sense is that, you know, we have some very good 
you know, organizations like the Human Rights Consortium and others here are very engaged as an umbrella organization in the civil society and you know, drawing upon a range of experiences and really feeding into a wider conversation. Really, in a sense, what I find myself is that when you go out and engage and talk to people here, people here still want a, a Bill of Rights. They still feel there's a need for a Bill of Rights and they still feel that the sorts of rights that the Commission proposed uh, are the ones they would like to see there. And I think what's been really striking in the last while has been as well on social and economic rights protections. And perhaps that's connected in some way, obviously, to the global pandemic at the moment, focus on healthcare. I suppose there's a sense in which people quite rightly say, well, why aren't some of these things fully legislated for? Why aren't the guarantees there in law? And you know, personally at the you know what a what a fitting tribute to some of the you know to healthcare workers and others who've seen us through the current crisis to enshrine in a bill of rights strong protections for social and economic guarantees including uh, healthcare yeah i must say some of the conversations i've had if uh, you know s some of the things that some groups have been throwing up or things that I would never have, have dreamt of. And uh, I'm sure we, we, we'll, we'll see these as the consultation responses come through. But at the same time, I, I must confess, it kind of petrifies me a wee bit. Whenever we'll obviously we'll have a, a large number of responses to this, but how we are or who is going to wade through all these responses and and discern what are rights or should be rights and what shouldn't, you know, what what could be addressed elsewhere or is already or, or should have already been addressed in legislation. I think it's going to be uh, very difficult. I think you know, a lot of people obviously will be thinking about themselves and their own organisations and their expertise in, in that area. And it'll be kind of, what about me? <laughs> But Mark, maybe if I just res respond to, to that again, a lot of expertise uh, in this region in terms of collaboration, engagement, of harnessing the views of wider society. So maybe just to urge the committee this afternoon to you know think about designing processes that really draw upon that expertise in civil society to try and harness that in a collaborative way. I know you're all as committee members uh, and as elected representatives concerned about issues of co-design and developing things in partnership. So, you know, let, let's be creative and imaginative and think about ways that we can work together to sort of draw in that experience out there. So to design a process that takes all those views on board in the final report that you produce. Okay. Thanks, Amanda and Colin. Thank you, Mark. Thank you very much. Um, th thank you very much, Professor Harvey. We I think we've now lost quorum. There's only um, three members on um, the, the the meeting, but we, we managed to, to get through everyone's questions. So, look, thank you very much for your patience. Thanks for joining us this afternoon. That was really interesting, and and your answers to, to all the different questions were brilliant. So, thanks very much. We'll we'll close the the meeting there. Thank you very much, and wish you all the best in your work. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, that, that's us then. Thank you. Brilliant. Yeah, thanks a lot. <laughs> See you all so ne okay. next time. Thanks, everyone. Bye. 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 This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29.